to start with. We can do a couple of those. Luke? 61, I think it was B. Which section, though? 5.461. Okay. Uh, it says, this is the one. The acceleration function in meters per second squared and the initial velocity are given for a particle moving along a line. Find A, the velocity at time t, and B, the distance traveled during that time. So we know that the integral of A to t is going to equal V of t plus c, right? So if I do that, um, v of t plus c is going to be t squared over 2 plus 4t plus c. And if I know that v of 0 is 5, I know that 0 squared plus over 2 plus 4 times 0 plus c has to equal 5, or c is equal to 5. So for part a, my velocity function is t squared over 2 plus 4t plus 5. Right? Okay? And then my position function is going to be s of t, which is going to equal like the integral of v of t, right? Now, if I want the total distance traveled, though, that's going to be different than position, right? Because if we just have something moving back and forth, like that covers a lot more distance than just the position change from there to there, right? So the way we do that is we do the absolute value. I guess I should have a dt at some of these things, huh? Okay. So if I am going to then graph, or what I'm going to do then is I'm going to figure out, looking at this guy, when is this below the x-axis? Because then I'm just going to break apart my integral and then you know, swap the sign on the parts that are below the x-axis to make it everything work out for me. So I'm interested in where t squared plus 4t plus 5 is equal to 0. So I can solve this a number of different ways, right? Uh, let's see if we can factor this first, I guess. So I'll multiply both sides by 2 to make life a little easier. But there aren't two numbers that multiply to give me 10 and add to give me 8. So we'll just use the quadratic formula, I suppose. Uh, so that's going to be negative 8 plus or minus 8 squared minus 4 times 1 times 10 all over 2 times 1. So let's see what those values are. And I'm going to just kind of streamline a little bit of the typing. So that one is not inside my interval, so I don't care about that one, right? Because my interval is 0 to 10. So that's fine. But it's below the x-axis starting at 0, right? Well, presumably. Um, to get my other one, I just need to change that plus sign to a minus. Oh. That's not what I expected. Did I do something wrong? Uh, 
doesn't seem right. Let me look at the, the old answers here just to make sure I didn't goober something. Su surprising to me. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's fine then. That's what it's supposed to be. So if I think about this, then my velocity function looks like that, where it's above the x-axis the whole time, right? So I'm good. I can just integrate from 0 to 10 of this guy, dt. Cool with that? Um, I'm confused why um, there is y. So because my velocity function is always above the x-axis, yes. the, it never like doubles back on itself. So the, dis, the change in position is going to be the same as the distance traveled. Because it never reverses direction to go backwards. So it's just continuing to go forward the whole time. So the displacement over that time will be the same as the distance traveled because the velocity never goes negative to like, oh, no, I'm going to turn around and head back the other way I was going. Oh, okay. And so even though you're, you get those negative results, that's your, the left side of your trajectory. Yeah. And I don't care because I'm integrating so from not, 0 to yeah, 10. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Paul. So let's say that like it did this, right? And we'll just say that's 2 and 7 or something. So I would integrate from 0 to 2. And then I would do, instead of adding that, I would do minus 2 to 7. So that's going to negate the part that's negative to make it positive and then 7 to 10. So I'm just going to like break it apart so that I can make sure that the part that's negative here is accounted for. So that's the trick. The same question you had, Victoria. Okay, great minds think alike, right? Does that feel okay? Okay. I got that weird result, and I'm like, wait a minute. And I looked at it, so, oh, okay, well, they can just do it, okay. So I must have done that, right? I was surprised by it. Made me stop and think, Ooh. So maybe like you should avoid uh, Yeah, that's essentially what I was doing when I solved it for zero, was that you could have accomplished the same thing by graphing. You would have saved yourself the hassle of like, you know, but yes, you could also use the graph just to, uh, or the graphing function or calculator to find the intercepts even if you needed to. I just try to treat all these problems as not a calculator problem if they don't have to be a calculator problem. Um, just to show that, like, to model how you could do this by hand without a calculator. Since there are sections of the AP exam that would conceivably ask you to do this without a calculator, although I think that this one given the nature of the radicals you're dealing with, probably would be a calculator question. If, this, if that quadratic was factorable, I would say fair game, no calculator. But when you get that kooky radical in there, it's like, ugh, what's the square root of 64 minus 40? Square root of 25. I mean, like, you could do it, but like 8 plus the square root of 24 and 8 minus square root of 20, or negative 8 plus the square root of 24 and negative 8. I mean, I guess you know they're both negative, but like that's I think is a tall ask, unnecessarily tall ask for a problem where you're supposed to be worrying about the calculus, not you know, can you deal with no calculator here? Um, other questions from homeworks. So that's just how you answer. Uh, well, you just it's now then you do the you do that still. The yeah, the definite integral there, but that's. I mean, at worst case scenario, you type that in your calculator, use FN int, and it'll spit out your answer for you, right? You could do that even at that point. 
the hard part is getting it set up to make sure it's like, okay, I'm going to get them all. But that would, that'll work. What's the, you know, the antiderivative, what's it? B, you know, that. Right? Uh, yep. And if you plug that in, I guess you get like 416.6. Repeating is what the textbook says. I wasn't really interested in doing that. The nice part is, though, that if you look, the zero doesn't really matter, right? Because all that stuff is just going to go to zero when you plug the zero in. So that part's nice, at least. OK. Um, we're going to go on and start talking about 5-5 five, five here for a bit. I need your guys' help. If we get to 10 o'clock and I haven't stopped yet, please say something and stop me. Because we're going to do the homework quiz here the last half hour or so a class. No. Um, 9.50. If we get to 9.50 and you haven't, I haven't stopped yet, you guys say something, please. Okay, so I want 40 minutes, excuse me. Okay. So, section 5.5. Five. We've been Dealing with this integration, we've seen that the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to just worry about antiderivatives. What if we have something like this, where we have the product of two functions? Oh no, I don't have any antiderivative rule to handle this directly. Well, if you recall though, what kind of derivative most often led to the product of two functions? The chain rule, right? Right, if we did d dx of f of g of x, oh boy, what happened here? That was the derivative of f times the derivative of g, right? So maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe this was the result of some chain rule problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the stuff that's underneath because that would have been my g of x, the function inside of the function, because that part is the same before and after the derivative. Everybody agree with that? So what I like to do then is I'm going to say, okay, that part I'm going to call u. So now I have like the integral of 2x times the square root of u dx. Now I'm still not quite to a place where I can differentiate because I still have x's in that integral, right? So somehow I need to change that x and dx to include just u's. So what I do is, I'm going to just take, okay, I said u is 1 plus x squared. What's du dx going to be? Because again, remember, du dx is, should be that, right? So the derivative of 1 plus x squared is just 2x. Everybody's good with that. And if I treat du dx like a fraction, I can multiply both sides by dx. Oops. And I can say du is equal to 2x dx. Hey, hey, hey. Look at that. So if I make that substitution, 
This is just going to be the integral of the square root of u du. And that's, that's something I have an antiderivative rule for. So that's going to be u to the 1 half plus 1 over 1 half plus 1 plus c or 2u to the 3 over 2 over 3. Everybody's okay with what I did there? And the last thing I'm going to do then is substitute back in 1 plus x squared for u. This process is called U substitution. And this will be our go-to method when we see that we have the integral of one function inside of another. So from here on out, I just have a boatload of numeric exam or problem examples that we're going to run through together, kind of get used to this process. So let's take a look at this first one, the integral of x cubed cosine x to the fourth plus 2 dx. What should I select as my u? Paul? Yeah, the function that's on the inside. And then I take the derivative of that. And if I multiply both sides by dx, I get 4x cubed dx is equal to du. But look at my problem and look at what I have there. What's the issue? I have a 4 there, but I have no 4 here. Everybody see that? How do I solve that? I'll just divide both sides by 4. Easy fix, right? So now x cubed dx is going to equal du over 4. Now that du or the 1 over 4, I can just take out to the front. What's, and now we have an integral that we know the antiderivative for. What's the antiderivative of cosine? Sine. And then all I need to do is drop my value for u back in. Uh, what was that? x to the fourth plus 2. OK. So sometimes, like, there may be an extra constant left over, right? All we do is we divide it over, package it together with the du, and it just 
drops right in and it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what yeah. happened to the x cubed that we started with? So the x cubed that we started with got substituted away as part of my du over 4. Okay. Right? When I plugged in the du over 4, I, had, I got rid of the x cubed and the dx. Does that feel okay? Okay. So, um, when you have d and dx, are you, which part are you taking the derivative of? Is that going to be that x cubed? So, here I took the derivative of this. So, the derivative of u is du dx, and the derivative of x to the fourth plus 2 is just 4x cubed. That's what I did there. Is that okay? Okay. Going too fast? I can slow down if we need to. That's okay. Let's take a look at this next one. What should we pick as our u? 2x plus 1, right? the part that's inside the function. Now we'll take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, so u becomes du dx. What's the derivative of 2x plus 1? 2. We'll multiply both sides by dx. We'll just treat that like a fraction. Now, if I look up above, do I have a factor of 2 there? No, right? So all I do is divide both sides by 2. So I can replace my dx with du over 2. So that one half can come out front. And then this derivative we've already done, right? Or the antiderivative we've already done. Do you guys remember what it was? And then those guys can cancel out. So our u was. 2x plus 1. There we go. Taylor? Okay, just a little clarification on this. Mm -hmm. So you find, like, you pull out the, the like, thing that's in, in the DU, mm -hmm. 2x plus 1, mm -hmm. take the derivative of that, mm -hmm. and then solve for DU. What we do next is we try to get the leftovers oh, so you solve equal DX. to whatever else. Okay. So you solve for dx and then substitute the dx. Well, in this one, we solve for dx. In this other one, we'd want x cubed times dx. Oh, so anything that's on the outside. Yeah. The leftovers. The leftovers. The leftovers. So you solve for that and then you plug that in. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yep. At least so far. Yeah. Do they get more complicated? Well, yeah, of course. But you guys are doing wonderfully so far. All right, let's take a look at this one. What do you want to pick as your U? Okay. Okay. 
So now we'll do the derivative of both sides. And remind me again, what are the leftovers that we're looking for here? x dx. Excellent. Everybody see that? Those are my leftovers. So I just need to divide both sides by negative 8. There we go. So when I plug everything in, I'm going to pull that negative 8 out, 1 over 8 out front. I'm going to have u to the negative 1 half du. Is everybody okay with me streamlining that a little bit there? And what I did, just saving myself a little bit of writing, you know what I mean? So I pulled the negative 1 eighth from the du to the front. And I rewrote instead of 1 over the square root of u, I just wrote as u to the negative 1 half. Okay. So when I do my antiderivative, so I have my negative 1 eighth, then I'm going to have u to the negative 1 half plus 1, or positive 1 half, over positive 1 half, which is just the same thing as times 2. And then I can reduce that fraction just to make square root u over 4 plus c. Oh, I can't box that yet. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I got to put my stuff back in. Great googly moogly. And there's a negative sign that I forgot somewhere along the way. It was 1 minus 4x squared, I think, right? My apologies, folks. Got box happy there. But that's nice, because what have I just done? Identified a very common mistake, right? You're not done until you plug your u back in. So don't forget to do that. It's easy to do. I just did it. But this is not so bad, right? If this is like, kind of, I think this is the hardest thing we do in chapter five. This is the last section of chapter five, by the way, if you didn't notice. What? I know. We won't finish it today. Uh, let's do this next one. The integral of e to the five x dx. What should I pick as my u? Five x. And then differentiate both sides. Multiply both sides by dx. By the way, what is the leftovers that I'm looking for here? dx. is Just dx is the leftover, right? So we'll better divide both sides by 5 then. Okay, so I'll take my one-fifth to the front, e to the u, du, which is just one-fifth, e to the u plus c, and I plug my 5 in, or my 5x back in for u, and that. okay we're doing all right you guys tell me if you weren't please okay ah here's a good one did i scroll past one that i didn't did i skip one here guess not okay oh there it is that was the one i was okay uh, let's do this one. 
This one's, uh, I think, a quite a bit trickier. The U should be 1 plus x squared. Everybody agree with that? We'll do the derivative. So that should be is equal to 2x. Uh-oh. What are the leftovers? What do I have over here? I mean, I can divide the 2 over, but I'm still short a lot of x's, aren't I? So let's plug in what we have so far and just kind of see. I'd have that, right? Is everybody cool? What are we going to do with that x to the fourth? Well, I know that u minus 1 is equal to x squared. Well, that's the same thing as like x to the fourth times x. That's the trick. So what am I going to replace x to the fourth with? u minus 1 squared. Yes, excellent. And let's put that 1 half out front. Do I have an antiderivative for this, the way it's currently written? I do not. What should I do? No. Yeah. Foil it out and then distribute the square root of u back through. Much, much easier. So that's going to be u to the 2.5 minus 2u to the 1.5 plus u to the 0.5. Du. Right, because this was u squared minus 2u plus 1. And then I distributed through the u to the 1 half. I did them as decimals because it's like I start, the fractions start getting weird and it's just like, ah, I'll just I'll just do decimals. Right? It's no big deal. So we'll do the antiderivative. Everybody's good with that. And watch this. When I distribute the 1 half through, look at what happens to those denominators. And that's pretty good. If you wanted to, you could make those uh, those exponents into fractions again, but whatever. 7 over 2, 5 over 2, 3 over 2 if you want. Go for it. I'm, I'm going to just leave them like this. That's fine. Oh, and the U. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. What was this? One plus X squared, I think, was the U. Yep, you caught me again. I just get so excited. I'm like, yeah, did it. It's like, no, not quite. I love that you're on the ball, though, looking for it. This is the kinds of mistakes that mis plagued Mr. Kulik's career as a student. Like you do everything right, and then you forget the last stupid little thing. Yes, sir. Okay, let's scroll back to that. So x to the fourth is really x squared times x squared, right? So x squared, if we rearrange our equation for u, is u minus 1. So I have u minus 1 times u minus 1 or u minus 1 squared. Either way of writing it would be okay. Jack? Yes. So like I just took my x to the fifth and thought about it as x to the fourth times x dx, and then I did my substitution okay. for my leftovers. Yeah. It's like that's as much of the leftovers as I can get out of the derivative. Yeah. The other stuff, I had to rearrange my initial substitution and make another substitution. Yeah. Yeah, and that's sneaky, right? Yeah. Pretty sneaky. So in our, um, in our like, integrand, mm -hmm. um, when it's going to have an integral, minus integral times x, you square the u minus 1. Mm -hmm. Because u minus 1 is x squared. By yes. squaring that, you're technically getting x to the 4, mm -hmm. which gets us x to the 5th. Right, with the du. Right, the du had an x in it. Very sneaky, right? These are the worst ones where you have like that extra substitute in for you. Where your derivative can account for all the leftovers. And you have to make a second substitution back in with the u. It's not uncommon that this happens, but it's it's sneaky to kind of work through. It's a lot of symbols to hold on to. All right. Um, based on people moving around, I can see that it's 9.50.